Yes, so let me just say something about um, Professor von Hiking. Professor von Hiking is Professor of Political Science at the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, where he te teaches political philosophy, religion, and politics. He is the author of a book called Augustine and Politics as Longing in the World, which was a co-edited work of, uh, it is another work of, uh, this is the second work, isn't it? Yes, a friendship? No, or it's connected. Yeah, no, no, the friendship is separate. Okay, yeah. good enough. Um, yes, co-editor of Friendship and Politics, Essays in Political Thought, Civil Religion and Political Thought, um, Teaching an Age of Ideology, and the Primacy of Persons in Politics, as well as two volumes of the collected works of Eric Vogelin. The topics of his scholarly articles include friendship, cosmopolitanism, liberal education, multiculturalism, civil religion, political representation, citizenship, republicanism, just war, Islamic political thought, and leadership. That is definitely an agenda for, what, 50 years of <laughs> political theory. Anyway, um, I'll pass on to Great. you. And we're all very much looking to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you for inviting me to come talk today. It's indeed an honor to be at a place like Carleton, which I think I'm going to appreciate is probably the best place in Canada, if not North America, to study political thought. And it's very impressive. And many, I've learned a great many things from all of the theorists here over the years, and not only about political theory, but also about the nature of education and its various challenges. And uh, I don't need to mention all the different works that Peter and, and Randy have written on, on the nature of education. And I, I mention that not only to, to butter them up, um, but also to point out that the, the one most recent book that I edited, uh, or co-edited, Teaching in an Age of Ideology, which I uh, uh, have the, uh, the, the little pamphlet, the flyer printed out there, in case you want to, you're interested in it. The, that idea first originated years ago in an, maybe an offhanded comment that Peter made in one of his books, where he talked about being uh, the experience of being educated by great thinkers, and uh, the phrase he used was uh, when he described his time at the London School of Economics as being smoked at by Michael Oakeshott, and probably Minogue too. Um, and that, that phrase always kind of st stuck with me. And one of the reasons is that it kind of reminded me about the importance of the, the, the physical presence of, of teachers and students and teachers learning together in, in a physical uh, space. And so that got me thinking, and, and the way we f my, my colleague Lee Trepanion and I uh, formulated the qu question that we asked the contributors to consider for this volume was to consider these political philosophers primarily as teachers, but in general, how are they embodying thought in action? So to look at their activities of teaching um, as opposed to, say, what they said about teaching or what they said or wrote about education. And in particular, um, to consider the way they evoked what Plato calls the turning around of the soul. How do they evoke wonder? How do they evoke the love of wisdom in their students to turn around from the shadows of ideology to one of, of, of political philosophy. So the essays in there have, have a lot of um, discussions about the various ways that teaching is embodied, Every, everything from uh, Harvey Mansfield's uh, suits and his, his, his love of hamburgers, um, and of course his jokes, to you know, one student's astonishment at seeing his teachers go to church. So specifically, how do these teachers instill wonder? And that's the question that I'm posing today with my, my, my talk uh, on Eric Vogelin. How did Eric Vogelin, as a teacher, evoke wonder? And on the one hand, um, you know, the, the question is kind of simple. You can kind of talk to the students and, and kind of get a feel of what this, these people were like as teachers. Um, but at the same time, this question goes right to the heart of their entire academic exercise, as it does, you know, may think that the, 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 the myth of the, of the cave is in some ways the, at the heart of what's going on in a lot of uh, pl platonic political philosophy. Because at least in the case of, of, of Fogelin, the turning around of the soul 
is involves questions of well, what's the nature of the cave that the, the student finds herself in, and that for Vogelin involves a, a, an understanding of how he understood ideology as secondary reality. How does one inoculate students against the viruses of modern ideology? So you kind of have to kind of go d- down deep in the cave like Anubis going down into Hades. Um, and with Vogelin, the problem is less to do with simply ignorance, but more so and especially the willingness to reason. So the willingness of, to reason is a special pedagogical problem for Vogelin. And of course, once you kind of look at ideology as, as, as inhibiting this willingness to, to reason, then you can start opening up questions of, well, what are you turning towards? existential questioning, meditative questioning. Vogelin had various ways of framing that question. And of course with political science, Vogelin um, had a, you might say, a fairly Aristotelian understanding of political science that wisdom also includes phrenesis. And so it's not simply a turn towards abstract thought, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a turn towards phrenesis judgments. Wisdom in terms of practical judgment, wisdom that allows for the self-governing individual uh, with common sense, practicing political friendship. So there's a lot on the plate in the Vogelinian enterprise in terms of education, and all I can really do is kind of give you a bit of an outline of what he's trying to do. So for Vogelin, education he frequently referred to as the art of the periagoge, the turning around of the soul. And I'll just uh, read you the, the phrase in the Republic, I'm, you're, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but I'll just kind of get it out there, that Vogelin points us towards. And this is at 518d. He says, Plato or Socrates says, then there would be an art to this very thing, I said, this turning around having to do with the way the soul would be most easily and effectively redirected, not an art of implanting sight in it, but of how to contrive that for someone who has sight, but doesn't have it turned the right way or looking at what it needs to. That's from the um, Joseph, or, um, yeah, the Joseph Sachs translation. So for Vogelin, this turning around, you might say, is the cultivation of what Vogelin calls the existential virtues, the, 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 the ones that include the love of wisdom, but also the moral ones that help that love of wisdom out. And I think um, political and philosophical courage are very important for Vogelin, as is um, personal and political righteousness, DK. And you can see Vogelin's own sense of righteousness in his own confrontation with the Nazis, which I hope to get to near the uh, conclusion of my talk. But here's what Vogelin says about this, this passage in the Republic. He actually doesn't talk about that passage too frequently, but here's what he does say. And he says, he's writing in uh, the third volume of Order and History, the Perigoge is literally a heightened sense of daimonia which the daimon in the psyche will reach when he engages in cultivation or paideia through association through the eudaimonic agathon. So Vogelin is careful to kind of distinguish what you might say a religious conversion from this, he calls it this Dionysian kind of conversion. It's the platonic notion of the soul, but heightens sense of daimonia. So For Vogelin, it involves the entire person turning around, including their their moral, their intellectual, spiritual, and also civic uh, dimensions to them. And Vogelin always contrasted his outlook with the the, the utilitarian or the Humboldtian models of education that kind of, for Vogelin, he he, he views the Humboldtian uh, uh, kind of the building models of education that would have been... um, uh, predominant in the Central Europe where he was coming out of, but you might say they've, they've kind of transferred in here into North America too, with the notion of building uh, uh, an elite of, 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 of civic leaders and social scientists, and somehow there's kind of this trickle-down effect that you, you hope that wisdom sort of gains the masses. And Vogelin is actually kind of sounds almost like a leftist um, Democrat here where he's, he's quite insistent that no, civic education is a very crucial component of democratic education, you know, dem- democracy for the masses. And in fact, one of his activities when he was in Germany was trying to make that case in the German culture too, which for, for, for Vogelin had to get rebuilt in the post-war years, even by the, in the 60s when he was there. 
So he's always very active in the, the formulation of and, and defense of civic education um, for um, you know, non-philosophers or for non-scholars, um, especially in the first uh, part of his career, but also kind of in the middle part as, as well. <coughs> now for Vogelin, what's quite, quite fascinating is that the core of the scholar's activity, the way he describes the, the core of the scholar's activity is the scholar's moral relationship with the students. And I think this, this, is, an, this is an insight that is, you can see throughout his scholarship. But what's very interesting that he's always got the student-teacher moral relationship in mind. And he says it quite explicitly in one essay that he writes fairly early on. And it's on uh, Max Weber. He wrote it quite extensively on Max Weber. Uh, and he poses this problem with the relation to the limitations of Weberian social science. And here's what he says. If Weber, nevertheless, did not derail into some sort of relativism or anarchism, it is because even without the conduct of such analysis, he was a staunch ethical character and, in fact, a mystic. So he knew what was right without knowing the reasons for it. And here's the, the, key, the key point that Vogelin wants to make. But, of course, so far as science is concerned, that is a very precarious position. Because students, after all, want to know the reasons why they should conduct themselves in a certain manner. So I always have the, the image of the, the social scientist fr frantically waving his you know, arms at the students who are undergoing revolt. Act reasonably, act reasonably. But isn't that a value statement? And he continues, when the reasons, that is the rational order of existence, are excluded from consideration, emotions are liable to carry you away into all sorts of ideological and idealistic adventures in which the ends become more fascinating than the means. Here is the gap in Weber's work constituting the great problem with which I have dealt during the 50 years since I got acquainted with his ideas. So he points this as a central motivating factor in his, in his own scholarship, the relationship, the, the, the moral relationship to the students. And this problem is both uh, simple and it's also complex. Because it's simple, on the one hand, because the young want the, stu the teacher to give an account of themselves of some way. Why should I act reasonably? And of course, the social scientists cannot explain the problem is also complex because then the scientist or the, the scholar is then confronted with the, the imperative of having to demonstrate the reasonability of his enterprise. And, you know, I'm always kind of struggling with, with how to do this for, for students. I mean, you, you do it by doing it. But at the same time, students, you know, you can, even in the Republic, Paul Marcus tells Socrates, you know, I get frustrated because, you know, both you and the sophists get me into all these little corners and puzzles that I can't get out of. So how do I tell the difference between a sophist and a philosopher? And I guess today, you know, how do you tell the difference between a scholar and a conspiracy theorist? Right, so, you know, without the scholar just saying, you know, this is a bunch of horse manure. Right, so you have to sort of take the long road, I guess. So this more complex question of the scientist demonstrating the reasonableness of his activity is in fact the, the thrust of Vogelin's larger academic project, which of course required him to develop a philosophy of history, consciousness, that incorporates the, the empirical materials, the drama of humanity, and all these other key things that Vogelin saw. Um, but it always, always comes back to the inability of Weberian social science to explain why be reasonable. So a fuller account of, of, of Vogelin's uh, art of the pedagogy would, of course, involve a critique of uh, hi, hi, discussing his critique of social science and ideology and so forth. But I think I'm going to focus today more on uh, Vogelin's activities of how he preceded um, his reasonable scholarship in his own teaching. So looking more at the, 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 the biographical Vogelin and, and less at the, uh, at the Vogelin's writings. Vogelin as a teacher was something of a paradox. Um, people either kind of loved him or hated him. 
they either regarded him as a, as a kind of a high-flying phenomenon who, who was up there in the stratosphere, or as someone who kind of looked pretty Socratic, who could uh, d- distill and, and not necessarily simplify, but at least clarify the, the, the great philosophical and political problems. So you have a, a wide range of responses to Vogelin's teaching. So for example, uh, Tom Flanagan, who took classes with Vogelin at, when he was an undergraduate, regarded Vogelin more as a phenomenon rather than as a great teacher. He could mesmerize students with vast amounts of knowledge, but Flanagan says, I don't even remember really learning what I learned from Vogelin. So he compared him, com- he didn't compare as favorably favorably with some of his other teachers at Notre Dame. But on the other hand, some like Ellis Sandoz regards Vogelin in more in the Socratic way of, of having a clarity of presentation and also giving students a sense of intellectual adventure. So that it's that notion of intellectual adventure that you can kind of see, you know, if you couldn't quite keep up, then he was mesmerizing, but if you could keep up, then of course that was a life-changing event, this, this, this turning around. Vogelin could be quite rough with students, especially graduate students, less so with undergrads, um, but uh, with students who exhibited um, marks of, of ideological deformations. And uh, a lot of people thought that he was too hard on a lot of people because of this. Um, and, and usually the way that people kind of explain this is that, well, look, if you had to fight against the Nazis and stand up to the Nazis in your 30s and 20s, you'd have a pretty thick skin. You'd be pretty blunt. So you wouldn't worry about offending some, you know, overly sensitive American undergraduate, you know, because you spent your time staring down, you know, Hitler youth, right? Um, may not be a, the best answer, or the best defense, but, you know, you can kind of understand where the guy's coming from. Um, but at any rate, I mean, there are just as many, perhaps more, who, who regarded him as as a kind of an old world figure exhibiting this old world kind of Austrian magnanimity too. With I mean, and I'm speaking here mostly of uh, his relationships with undergraduates. Um, so there's kind of all, you can see some some contrasts in the way people responded to Vogel and in, in depending on where they are situated. So for example, uh, there's a difference between Vogel and as a teacher of Americans versus teacher of Germans. Uh, the, the teacher towards Americans, uh, that's where uh, he exhibited a lot of this old world magnanimity that a lot of people really appreciated. Um, later on in the 60s when he would teach uh, every two, two years at Notre Dame, there was a, a, a probably a marked uh, 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 sharpening of his critique of ideology that would have attracted certain conservative, uh, especially anti-communist Catholics at Notre Dame that kind of congregated around him. Um, but what's quite fascinating is that he's a very different figure in Germany. Towards the German Germans, you could say that he carried himself kind of like a Socratic gadfly towards the German culture. But interestingly, he was kind of a father figure too. Uh, a gadfly in the sense that when he uh, was uh, in, in Munich in, in Germany starting in 50, I think it was 58, um, this is still post-war kind of ideological, cultural uh, repercussions, lots of, of, of communism, of course, Marxism was very popular in the universities. So it's it very much a kind of a witch's brew of ideology still. And, mo- and most importantly, it was a witch's brew that still hadn't really confronted the demons of Nazism yet. And I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, and, and that's where the gadfly aspect uh, comes into effect. Um, but he's also a father figure too, and especially for, for not just for undergraduates, for, but for graduates too, because he represented and, and articulated a new order, a new moral and spiritual order for Germans. Um, and what you have to remember is that a good number of, of German um, students, young people in the post-war period, um, even if they hadn't, they would have been too young to fight in the war, their fathers would have, and many of them would have been members of the Nazi party. And that right away uh, delegitimized them as father figures. And what you see in a lot of the relationships of Vogel and to his younger students, he may not, Vogel himself may not have noticed this, but a lot of his, his especially his graduate students, kind of saw him as, as that father figure. 
um, precisely because the the, the, the the father's generation had had become morally bankrupt. So you, you know you, you see a parallel, I think, between Vogelin and the Germans, and say Socrates and the young of, of, of Athens, where the fathers of the Athenians kind of lost their, their legitimacy as well. Um, with the Germans too, you also have, uh, strangely enough, kind of an erotic dimension. Too. And you know, remember the turning around of the soul is not just the soul, but you know, it's the full person. And um, one former uh, German student noticed how frequently uh, Vogelin's uh, female students would kind of respond in this, in this you, you might say, uh, erotic way. And I'll just read the, 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 the statement that, that he makes. And he says, their eyes were open and their legs were open, and they looked as they were in a mixture of relaxing and the opposite of relaxing. So erotic tension. And, you know, I don't know, maybe Vogelin was a good-looking guy, but I've seen pictures of him, and I don't think he would, you know. (laughs) As a physical specimen, he wasn't all, you know. (laughs) But there's something there. There's something there that probably um, was amplified and, and, and found greater traction, especially in, in the German culture. Now, amongst um, graduate students who have written a lot more and, and you know, have greater access to talking to for- Vogelin's former graduate students, this is where Vogelin, the, the mesmerizing phenomenon, is, is definitely more approachable because you have to get through various steps before you're allowed into the graduate workshop. Um, Thilo Schabert, who is a student of Vogelin, refers to uh, Vogelin's workshop. And it's quite a fascinating account that he provides. But with his graduate students, he'd always be testing his new theories, you know, throwing new books that have come out. So it's very much you, you are a participant in the intellectual adventure. And it would be a kind of a free-flowing debate. So Vogelin would, would always like to test his new theories, new ideas, new words, even with Vogelin's. And so Sch- Schabert uh, says that the workshop brimmed with creative excitement. And so there you find kind of a, a sharing of that erotic excitement, too. And you, you see that that's a key component in how the turning around of the soul also has that community-building function that, at least at, at a civic level, would be uh, political friendship. This, what Chabert describes is not political friendship. It's a higher kind of friendship, but it's, it's kind of a kernel of, of that. So then, for Vogelin, the teacher's reasonable vocation you know, is acting reasonably, and this, first and foremost, is an erotic search for wisdom. That's not simply excitement and curiosity, but it's an excitement born of searching together and searching together about the truths of how to live. And so it's, it's, it's that sharing. Now, Vogelin himself, um, you know, I want to make a distinction between the sharing of wisdom and having a school. Um, I mean, there's lots of Voglinians, and that's a term that Vogelin always told people, you know, avoid that. Right? And, and in fact, he kind of, he wanted to have a school, but not his school. So he always wanted to make sure that his students were always studying things that were not his stuff. I don't know, in fact, if, if he ever really um, assigned his own works in his class. But he was always trying to move one step ahead. Um, but at any rate, especially when he moved to Germany in '58, he had great hopes of restarting an experience that he enjoyed as a young scholar, as a young man in Vienna. Um, And he wanted to create a a Geistkreis, a spiritual circle of scholars uh, in Munich that would be centered mostly around his graduate students um, as a way of a building block for German intellectual life, but also civic life, too. And you could probably say that that, prob- that, that part of it, I think for Vogelin, kind of ended in failure. He, he ended up uh, isolating himself too much, not from his students, actually, but from uh, the, the other parts of German academic life and, and professional life in Germany. So he can never really establish that Geistkreis in the way I think that, that he wanted to. But that's kind of what he strove for. And that leads me to this, the final part of my presentation. Um, for, for Vogelin, you, you need that, you, you want that, 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 that uh, animating, I, I hesitate to use the word vanguard because it has too many connotation, but that, 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 that counterweight of, of genuine learning and uh, that, that seedbed 
of intellectual friendship to be a, a kind of a starting point for a broader reorientation of the culture of, of, of political friendship. And this political or that the civic dimension of learning and teaching is quite evident in a series of lectures that Vogelin did in 64 called Hitler and the Germans. And this was arguably the apex of Vogelin's teaching career. Because what you see going on in his lectures of Hitler and the Germans, this is where Vogelin really um, tried to confront the demons of Nazism uh, in German culture, and if you if you read the, the the lectures, I mean, there's a reason why it's called Hitler and the Germans. So how did this monstrosity occur? How, what were the intellectual, moral, and spiritual deformations? How could this how how could this occur in this society? So it's it's quite a, a thorough indictment, but it's also an attempt to ascend to the light. So it's it's very platonically. Um, uh, uh, structured in the way of, of going down into the cave and then trying to lift up. So he acted kind of like a Socratic guide for the underworld inhabitants of Germany in an attempt to refound German, German political order along the lines of political friendship. And this is, I think this claim is, is, is not quite as exaggerated as it seems. I mean, to, 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 to try to refound Germany, of course, is, is you know, it's a act of, of great magnitude if you could pull it off. But I think for Vogelin um, is very well attended. There were numerous uh, it was mostly attended by, by students, but students who would go on to some pretty significant positions both in German intellectual life and also in political <coughs> life too. Uh, for, for instance one of his students um, was instrumental in the construction of the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. So he was instrumental in putting that into, into, the, um, into the German cautiousness of its history. So he's trying to refound the noble cities in the souls of the young by having the Germans confront the lie of their history in their own souls. He's reenacting, in many ways, different parts of the republic in order to rebuild this uh, society. And the, the rhetoric, the performance of, his, of Hitler and the Germans um, kind of follows three basic steps. Um, and I'm borrowing this, this, these three basic steps from Brendan Purcell, who's done a lot more work on the lectures themselves. And the three steps, um, Purcell actually borrows these from Kierkegaard. Uh, it begins with the, the aesthetic realm, goes to the ethical realm, and then finally he's in the religious realm. And the aesthetic realm, the first one, is a way of presenting materials that Vogelin uses to show the per destructiveness of Nazism on the German psyche. It's to kind of lance the, the secondary realities, to see the absurdities of the various ways that um, even both during uh, the time of the Nazis, but also in the post-war time when people were kind of evading the reality and evading the demons of, of Nazism, he, he shows just how the culture had been, had been deformed. So he's trying to cauterize the wound um, uh, of these secondary realities by arousing moral indignation. Um, so he challenges the audience to share in some of that um, um, rejection of psychological destruction. So he uses lots of methods of irony and satire. Vogelin was a great reader of Karl Kraus, who was a famous uh, Viennese uh, satirist in, uh, uh, in the interwar period. Um, and the aesthetic is kind of a blunt tool to demonstrate how historians and philosophers of the post-war era were intellectual and moral, um, and to use Vogelin's term, ignoramuses. And the way he, he treats it, I mean, he, he kind of rouses. It's, he's, he's saying these, they're, they're saying things that get replicated in the culture. They become cliches, but if you really subject them to any kind of analysis, no intelligent person could believe such a thing. And this is a, a, a strategy that Vogelin had used over the years. Uh, I mentioned earlier that he confronted the Nazis. Well, he really did. In the 1930s, when the Nazi, during the Anschluss, when the Nazis came in, uh, Vogelin, who would later flee to America, um, still 
taught some classes where the Nazi youths would show up with their Nazi banners on their armbands and they would listen to them. And I've got this uh, statement here. Uh, many years ago, I interviewed um, a fellow who took law classes with Vogel in, in the 30s. Um, and uh, this is for the uh, Vogel and Recollected volume that Barry Cooper and Jenny Brun did. But I, I did some of the interviews for that. And this fellow was a student of Vogel in the 30s in the, in the law classes. And it, he paints just a, a remarkable, remarkable picture of what, what Vogel is doing. He's in this lecture hall at the University of Vienna in the law school, lecturing on the new Austrian constitution that the Nazis have brought in. And of course, all these Nazi uh, university students who are in party members are, are there listening quite intently. And this is what um, this, 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 by now, old man was telling me. He didn't in any way denounce the Nazis. There's no kind of lashing out at them. It was almost a kind of bantering about them instead. He would even smile as he said, have you heard this and this? And with a smile, he would mildly insinuate this or that and indicate that it was absolutely stupid or unlawful. He didn't say that they were stupid directly, of course. He just said, can you imagine it? They have done this. And of course, in a Socratic way, you know, let the, let the student draw his, his own conclusion. So this is, these are the sort of um, things he was doing also in, in the Hitler and the Germans. But I, I guess he, he could be a little bit more blunt and straightforward in those lectures because he wasn't worried about you know, the, the Nazis coming after him. So we go from the aesthetic to the ethical dimension. And here, Vogelin is trying to arise indignation from the secondary reality and turn that into an affirmation of a common reality. And one of the examples he uses as a way of, of arousing indignation, as a way also then of affirming common reality, is uh, he uses an example that was in the newspapers during some of the uh, trials going on of former Nazis. And he uses the example of a journalist who criticizes an Auschwitz survivor for breaking down on a witness stand and calling a former guard a murderer when in fact the guard had merely beaten him into a cripple. And so, you know, the, so this journalist then, is, you know, is in kind of a straightforward legalist way. Well, no, you weren't murdered. You were just beaten, you know, to a pulp. And of course, Vogelin, for Vogelin, the journalist is completely missing the human point here, this destruction of language um, and, and, and kind of reduction to things, kind of a, almost a positivist evasion of reality. And so here's what he says. For what, is, for what is saying is that one should peacefully allow oneself to be killed and shouldn't in any way shout murder as long as I have not been killed. So, yeah, so anybody who has you know, shouted out murder to someone who has not yet killed them is in the wrong, according to the journalist's logic. What I'm going to say. I must not say that the other person is a murderer. If I, say, if I see that this other one is committing murder, I still may not say murderer before he has been convicted in a proper court. So that is a way of showing the, the, the absurdity and, and really the, 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 the loss of, 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 of common reality that the journal, this post-war journalist had exhibited in his writing that Vogelin is presenting to the students as, as a, you know, one of these examples of destruction of language that reflects this uh, destruction of culture. Which leads then to the, the third uh, realm. Uh, it's probably not the best phrase in this context when talking about Vogelin in the third realm. So we're not <laughs> talking about the third realm of Wacom of Fiore, but rather the third uh, element of, of rhetoric in, in, in the lecture. And that is the religious, or more properly, the conversion to the transcendent. You might say that the, the move, the, the, the turning around of the soul. The order that judges the individual. And Vogelin identifies the source of ideological action in these lectures in a phrase from Novalis. And this is Vogelin uh, commenting. The world should, shall be as I wish it. There you already have in a nutshell the whole problem of Hitler, the general problem of de-divinizing and dehumanizing. Vogelin continues. 
The experience of reason and spirit agree on the point that man experiences himself as a being who does not exist from himself. He exists in an already given world. The world itself exists by reason of a mystery and the name for the mystery for the cause of this being of the world of which man is a component is referred to as God. So dependence of existence on the divine causation of existence has remained the basic question of philosophy up to today. Now, this is not simply uh, uh, Vogelin kind of proponing, uh, uh, being a proponent of traditional religion or Christianity, um, but rather what Vogelin sees as an openness that results from a life lived in judgment. And judgment is not necessarily divine judgment, although it could be that too, but as what, what, what Kierkegaard uh, once called existential judgment. To be judged by truth to answer the question, who are you? And that is, in effect, the standing in judgment that is the practice that Vogelin alludes to in that uh, statement that he makes about Max Weber. The teacher is being judged by the students. Uh, thank you. <laughs>